Good evening. Thank you for joining me again for another segment of A Voice from the Margin. I am your host, Ajamo Baraka. Well, tonight we're not going to have um, a, a lot of structured conversation. Uh, I thought it was important to just come to you. There's a, a number of things I wanted to talk about. Uh, I'm here in North Carolina, uh, getting prepared to participate in the uh, North Carolina State Green Convention this weekend. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that. I want to talk about uh, some other stuff that's happening in the news. Uh, everybody's talking about the uh, uh, the uh, Kome, um, uh, um drama that unfolded today. Uh, and I want to talk about, you know, some things on my mind in terms of the connection to what's happening with uh, the testimony provided by James Comey, uh, this whole uh, um, focus on the uh, Russian gate uh, and anti-Trumpism uh, and what that really means in terms of the kind of politics that the moment really uh, demands. But before we get into that, let me give you a, uh, a quick update. As many of you might recall, last week uh, we had a very important guest who came to us to talk about uh, what was unfolding in the country of Colombia uh, with the national strike that was organized by uh, a coalition of over 80 black organizations uh, in that country, demanding that uh, the decades uh, and maybe centuries of neglect uh, by the Colombian government uh, to be reversed. Uh, we all know that there is supposed to be a peace process in that country, but as part of the peace process, uh, there's been no real conversation, no real focus on the continued um, uh, detrimental material conditions that black people face uh, in that country. Symbolized, for example, in the city of Buenaventura, which is their port city, uh, the city where most of the commerce for not only Colombia, but for um, a significant part of Latin America uh, will enter and exit. But in that city, you have uh, black people who make up 90% of that population who don't even have consistent running water that's clean. Where there's no hospital, where the infrastructure is crumbling, where the education is subpar. And so finally the people stood up, rose up, and they took over the city and held that city for 22 days until Monday. And when we had uh, Chalo Mina Rojas with us last week, she explained uh, what was happening. Um, right after that conversation last Thursday, um, as I just indicated on Monday, there was an agreement between the organizers and the government uh, and they ended the strike for now. The government of Colombia committed to address the issues of infrastructure and water uh, and the violence in that city. Uh, so we had uh, the end of one of the most incredible examples of people power that uh, one can point to. Um, that has occurred in decades. And in fact, <laughs> some might argue, when was the last time you can point to an example where a movement took over a city of over 400,000 people, shut that city down and held it for 22 days, even in the face of massive repression uh, from the state? Uh, you may have to go all the way back to the Paris Commune. So it's a very, very interesting phenomenon that unfolded in Colombia. So I wanted to make sure that all of you knew that uh, that situation was uh, temporarily resolved on Monday. Um, and we're going to continue to watch that very closely. Well, we have another drama that's unfolding here in this country. Uh, we all have been waiting uh, for the testimony of James Comey, the fired FBI director uh, to see what he had to say about this uh, continued uh, focus on uh, Russia and the uh, investigation of the Trump administration, the Trump campaign, that is. 
Um, and, you know, I want to hear from you to see what you thought about what came out of the testimony today. I'm also curious, too, about one of my concerns around this whole Russian gay situation, and that is, you know, with this focus on the Russians and the Russians did it. I mean, to the, the extent that it's, it's almost absurd. Everything that happens, including the crisis uh, in, in the Middle East uh, with the, the attempt to isolate Qadar uh, by uh, the Saudis and the United Arab Emirates uh, and Egypt and others, um, something that was clearly uh, supported and given a green light to by the Trump administration, we look up and the day after that that happened, CNN runs a report that says that basically it's the Russians who were responsible for that. I mean, this Russian stuff is 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 almost it's a, it's absurd. It's like a running joke, and the fact that people are taking this stuff seriously is really, I just find completely incredible. The other element of this that I think is really uh, incredible is the fact that well, for the Democrats, they have they have placed their their emphasis. They're sort of uh, hung their political coat on this notion that they are going to get uh, uh, Donald Trump impeached or that the focus should just be on anti-Trumpism. Now, that to me seems to be a strategy that is uh, a political dead end. And one of the consequences of this strategy is that all of the issues that one would think that a oppositional political party would be uh, salivating to, to exploit, that is the fact that the Trump administration uh, is, is in the process of gutting medical care, um, uh, has a plan in place that's going to uh, detrimentally impact on its own base in various uh, states uh, with gutting uh, Medicaid. Um, uh, you know, the fact that he's asking for a $54 billion increase uh, in the military budget, that he has failed to get behind uh, any type of increase in the minimum wage, that uh, he is uh, threatening to devastate uh, the federal, uh, federal agencies in order to pay for uh, the military increase. You know, there are things there that, you know, it's clear that the Trump uh, campaign and the Trump administration is unable to deliver anything to its constituents and that the uh, an oppositional party would be focused in on that. But no, instead of a focus on the issues, instead of using uh, his inability to uh, and unwillingness to address the material needs of his own social base, uh, and exploiting that, no, instead, the, Ru the, the, the Democrats are focused on the, the Russians uh, and impeachment. And if Trump was impeached, what would that mean? It would mean the ascendancy of, of, of Mike, Mike Pence, who is a real conservative and has politics even more dangerous than Donald Trump. So where is the victory? And in the process, what happens to all of these important issues that we should be organizing and struggling around, uh, they're getting no attention. It's almost like it's almost like it's a, 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 a strategy on the part of the Democrats to indirectly support the agenda of the oligarchy, to allow for these issues to be implemented with no real opposition. So I'm curious to, to hear from, from you uh, what you think about the Comey and, and this uh, Russian gate and the, the uh, inordinate amount of attention directed toward uh, the politics of, of anti-Trumpism. Uh, so we're going to, to open up and, and get your, your suggestions, your questions, uh, your comments, on this phase of a voice from the margin. So uh, let me hear from you now. I want to see what you think about what is happening with uh, the Comey uh, testimony and what we see unfolding here uh, in this country 
uh, politically. Now, while we get those uh, uh, questions uh, in the queue, um, let me also make a very short comment on uh, another issue that's really, really important that we're not really uh, focused in on because of this Russian gate. And, and that is the continued uh, expansion of military activity um, in, in the Middle East and other parts of the world. Uh, the U U.S. has now directly attacked um, units that are associated with the Syrian army. We see, the, see this steady increase in uh, troop strength in Syria, which is illegal. Um, and we see that the Trump administration has agitated and created another crisis uh, with his own allies, uh, with the crisis with uh, Qatar uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, these are some very dangerous uh, issues. And it is incredible that uh, more and more people are, have allowed themselves to be uh, diverted away from a, a, a focus uh, and a, an analysis of these issues and their impact uh, because they're more concerned with this circus, uh, with this Trump uh, and, and Comey and the Russians did it. So Steve Martin says that in my two cents, I think the Russian um, stuff is a horse dog, a horse pony show uh, to make us look away from something the government is up to. Well, Steve, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's something to that, that uh, as long as we are focused in on on this issue of, of, of collusion between the Trump administration and or the Trump campaign uh, and the Russians, uh, as though there needed to be collusion for uh, Hillary Clinton and the Democrats to blow the election. You know, as long as we are focused in on that, we're not getting to the important issues that we should get to. We should be able to uh, exploit, uh, as I said earlier. So yeah, I think it is, uh, if it's not something conscious, it's definitely playing right into the into the hands of the, uh, of the oligarchy that has its own agenda uh, that it wants to see implemented. John Christman says, I say impeach and remove Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> well, um, I think that many people feel the same way when you look at, at the uh, percentage of people in the U.S. that have any kind of real uh, 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 respect for Congress. Uh, they see both parties as being uh, equally uh, condemnable. And I think that's something that has a real, a real basis. Uh, let's see. Lab Webster says, the deep state wants war with Russia. This is their method of getting it. Well, I mean, perhaps. I mean, I guess one of the questions has to be, uh, why would the deep state and why would other elements want to have a conflict with, with Russia? But another, I think, uh, connecting question is, uh, why is it that the Russians are, in fact, are supposed to be the enemies of the U.S.? What are the, the issues that make the Russians the enemy? You know, it's very, very interesting in terms of how uh, there's been sort of a uh, a, a psychological connection that people have made uh, between the Soviet Union, for example, and the, and, and the Russian Federation, as though we are looking at the same entity when they are profoundly different. The Russians are basically, uh, is another uh, capitalist state that wants to just do business, basically, uh, like the U.S. as a capitalist state. So, what is it that makes them the enemy? I think that's something people need to, to, to take a look at and attempt to answer for themselves. Maurice says, I think it's all manufactured craziness to keep Americans scared and misinformed. 
to allow the military industrial complex to wage endless wars for power and profit. Marie, I'm going to tell you something. I think that uh, I think that you you are onto something. I think that one of the one of the concerns that these powerful forces had uh, when it came to Donald Trump was that when he was talking about the possibility of some type of reconciliation with the Russians, uh, that uh, that could very well be threatening for those elements of the military industrial complex that depend on the U.S. having uh, a very visible boogeyman, if you will, someone that could help to justify the incredible amounts of money that this state is still expending on military outlays. It, it became clear that uh, even the al-Qaeda and the threat of terrorism uh, was something that was not really sustainable in terms of being able to to justify uh, steady increases in the military budget. You don't need to have a military budget and a standing army and Navy and Marines in order to just fight uh, non-state actors. You have to have a, a, a credible state um, villain. And who better to to play that role than, than the Russians? Uh, so when Trump was talking about um, some type of reset with the Russians, that was a real source of anxiety for some, for some very powerful elements, in my opinion, uh, in this country. Um, and that's why, as one of the reasons why I think that the oligarchy or elements of the oligarchy uh, targeted uh, uh, the Trump administration to be uh, destabilized, to be delegitimized. It wasn't because uh, Trump is a, a buffoon or a racist or a xenophobe. You know, we've had all of those before in office. It was because he had uh, was playing with some positions that uh, were threatening to that element of the oligarchy that are the transnationalists, the globalists, uh, the ones that see the U.S. as just one more nation on the planet uh, in which they have no special uh, loyalty to. You know, because their agenda and their concerns, their economic operations are global. Uh, and, and so when someone like Trump comes along to uh, threaten that international uh, agenda, that global agenda uh, of international trade under their control, of, of advancing and protecting the hegemony, uh, the domination of finance capital, uh, when he threatens that by opposing uh, the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership and talks about America first uh, and keeping jobs in the U.S. Uh, and resetting with the Russians uh, and maybe not being as uh, belligerent as the other American presidents. Uh, it was uh, a, a threat. And that is one of the primary reasons, in my opinion, that uh, this administration was, was, was targeted uh, by those elements. And if you if you if you look at what's unfolded over these last few months of his administration, there's only one period in which the uh, the the intensity of the criticism dissipated somewhat. And when was that? It was when it was when he attacked Syria. So, um, you know, there's something to all of that, uh, Maria. Uh, this this is a very insidious system, uh, and these uh, elements that really control the the state uh, and really control uh, this system, uh, they are prepared to do whatever they need to do to protect and advance their interests. Patricia Augustine says, "I would ask Attorney General Lynch about her saying for call me." Let's see, what is this? Uh, I'm not sure about this question. I think that you're asking that uh, you want um, Attorney General Lynch, uh, that at one point she was instructing Comey to uh, not call uh, the investigation, in fact, an investigation, but a quote unquote matter. Um, 
because, of course, of the possible impact it was going to have and did have on the on the campaign. Uh, look, we see the kind of, of insider uh, and corrupt kind of communications that were taking place um, even under the Obama administration. That's what makes this this supposed outrage that people have because um, Donald Trump may have tried to uh, evoke some degree of loyalty from Comey. Uh, that that is just really you know kind of silly and outrageous. That's what presidents do. You know, if if people were really morally outraged by that kind of insider attempt to influence uh, processes, I raised the question, where was the outrage when Bill Clinton uh, got off of his plane and went over and got on the plane with uh, Attorney General Lynch in the middle of an investigation of Hillary Clinton's emails? What kind of conflict of interest was that? You know, and where was the outrage, you know, from the CNNs and all of the other uh, outlets that uh, pretend to be so outraged by this attempt on the part of the Trump administration to uh, get his own way? Um, these are some of the things that we have to ask my friends in terms of this this whole situation and 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 ask ourselves. To what degree are we allowing ourselves to be caught up into this, these diversionary politics? Uh, I think it's really incumbent on all of us who, who, are, who are attempting to think clearly, uh, to see the world for what it really is, uh, for us to avoid these diversions and to focus in on the politics and the issues that really impact on people here in this country. You know, we have this move toward war. We have the, the gutting of, of the health care system. We have an opportunity to raise again the possibility of Medicare for all. These are important issues that we're not really addressing because we are caught up in this uh, diversionary, um, uh, this diversionary politics. So my friends, we need to uh, be critical. Uh, we need to uh, avoid uh, allowing ourselves to become supporters of a new kind of McCarthyism. Uh, that is when you raise critical questions about these, 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 these dramatics, uh, when you uh, question whether or not this makes sense or you question whose interests are really being addressed uh, through these these. Uh, hearings and this focus on 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 Trump as opposed to the structures of oppression. Uh, when you raise questions about why the U.S. is expanding its presence in Syria, uh, why is it that the U.S. continues to support uh, repressive governments uh, in various parts of the world? Uh, why is it that the U.S. has to be the enemies, uh, the enemy of Russia, and you are accused of being pro-Putin? Uh, we cannot allow ourselves to be intimidated uh, by this kind of neo-McCarthyism. We have to keep uh, clear and, 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 and sober. Uh, we've got to keep our uh, focus on the issues that we have to raise and organize around and educate around. Uh, if not, then we will inadvertently continue to uh, play right into the hands uh, and the interests of those uh, uh, elite elements that don't have our interests at hand. Uh, so we've got to be clear, my friends. Um, yes, Jacqueline says that, uh, yes, she says that the neo-McCarthyism is really crazy and it's scary. She says she's witnessed several reporters being called communists or uh, Putin lovers for questioning whether there's any evidence. Um, you know, they've been talking about this, this collusion, but and we have these uh, incessant uh, uh, investigations, but nothing's been uh, brought to the surface yet. While, while at the same time, we still are seeing these reports that says that there are elements in the uh, intelligence agencies that says that, you know, there's, there's, there's been no collusion. There's no hard evidence that there was any kind of hacking of the 
of the uh, of the of the electoral machines. Um, you know, so this is just some uh, the continuation of of just some silliness on the part of elements in the deep state, and in particular, uh, people who are associated with the Democratic uh, Party. So my friends, we, we have to remain uh, clear. Um, we have to prioritize those issues that are important to us. We have to look at things like, what are we doing on a local level to organize ourselves? What are we doing on a local level in terms of, of, of developing structures that address our real needs? Um, and on that, I wanted to bring in uh, a, a friend and guest for these last few minutes, uh, just to talk very briefly about some work, this in some activities that take place here. Uh, I'm here in, in Hillsboro, uh, North Carolina, and I have joining me uh, Bob Berkman, longtime activist, uh, journalist, uh, intellectual. Um, host of a very important radio program uh, who's been really laser focused on the importance of local development, local politics. And he, him, me, he, him and I sometimes struggle because, you know, I'm always sort of out there someplace else. He's, he, he helps to bring me down to where we really need to have a real solid base. So, Bob, thank you for joining us these last few minutes. Talk a little bit about what you all are trying to do and why you think it's really important to focus in on the local level. Well, first of all, thank you for asking me to participate. Uh, it's great to see you. And uh, for me, it's mostly a pragmatic thing. I think uh, getting old, uh, I feel like I have to accomplish something. And it has become clear that uh, <clears throat> wringing my hands at the, uh, the machinations in Washington and uh, the global strategic manipulations and all the rest of it uh, is not really uh, serving me and my ability to accomplish anything in uh, the time I have remaining. And so uh, really from a practical standpoint, local uh, is the way you can get things done. And we are uh, making every effort to uh, do such things as rebuild the social safety net here in uh, the community of Hillsboro and uh, Orange County in North Carolina. If you're familiar with Orange County uh, or Hillsboro, you know that there is a, a good strong sense of community already here. If you're also familiar with the state of North Carolina, you know that uh, there are some of those same retrograde um, points of view that have uh, gained supremacy through uh, the electoral system. And we cannot rely on the state or the feds any longer to uh, provide for us some of those essential services or to uh, come up with solutions to these pressing needs uh, that we see at every level of society. And so uh, the way that we uh, have decided we have to uh, move forward is at the local level by building community-based uh, economic and social institutions and to try and make them actually work. And we are having some success doing that I think the old adage of thinking globally and acting locally, some people uh, say that without really understanding what the uh, applications uh, of, of that would be, but uh, they really are pretty simple. You think globally, you have a global perspective, you create models that can then be exported uh, elsewhere to other communities that can replicate success. You test drive ideas, you can do that on a small scale you can't really do that very easily or successfully on a massive scale. And so that's just another reason why uh, we should try and operate and create these models. It used to be that uh, the feds or the states would incubate ideas uh, and maybe uh, try and uh, uh, test drive uh, ideas uh, at the local level, um, but that is no longer the case. Uh, so, uh, Sorry for that little uh, interruption there. Uh, so we have had some, some very good success um, at the government level interacting with nonprofits 
uh, and professionals, service providers, people working in concert uh, to create models for healthcare delivery, um, volunteers, for example, working with uh, our local uh, government agencies on senior care, for example. Senior care is one of those areas where we're seeing an increasing need, uh, a shrinking uh, resource base um, as baby boomers age out. Uh, where are they going to live? So you have this whole new model for aging in place, for keeping people in their homes so they don't get displaced and have to go into institutional settings. That involves a whole series of uh, alternative mechanisms than the ones we have where we warehouse uh, senior citizens in for-profit institutions. That's just one example. Exactly. Well, you know, and, and I think that you know, we, 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 have, we need to talk about this in more detail in another show. But how do you how do you how do you get to those alternatives without having political power? And what's the importance of trying to gain political power on the local level? You have to have consensus and you have to have an understanding. One of the things that serves us, uh, and I know that uh, this is a Green Party forum, uh, but we, I think, all agree that the two-party uh, duopoly has not served us well. One of the ways that Hillsborough has succeeded, and to some extent Orange County, is by uh, taking a nonpartisan approach. So our elections here in town are nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. This really helps because you start stripping away those labels of Republican and Democrat, of liberal and conservative, and suddenly you can have real conversations with people about issues that matter to everyone. That is a big part of it. And then you have leadership, that's in short supply these days, certainly in Washington, the higher up you go in the ladder, the less evidence of real leadership there is. You have to identify and encourage and promote leadership uh, and support it. Um, there are a number of uh, elements that you have to have in place, but you also have to have people talking to each other. That is something that we used to do. Um, mm -hmm. The whole marketplace of ideas used to be you know, what we were sort of uh, all about uh, as a society, that's kind of evaporated and it's just a bunch of people screaming at each other, often based on identifications. And these identifications, to my mind at least, are often uh, really, they're, they're not real. They are artificial constructs. We are all three-dimensional beings whose perspectives are uh, often progressive, but there are some things maybe we have that are more conservative, some positions. We think in three-dimensional ways and not in this sort of linear two-dimensional way that we are uh, allegedly, you know, uh, forced to uh, occupy. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that's another thing. And if you can have dialogue, if you can really do that successfully with people of different political persuasions, suddenly you can get things done. Mm -hmm. And remarkably, partly because we have a nonpartisan approach mm -hmm to our basic uh, political structure, our uh, board of commissioners, is uh, not partisan elections. You are able to achieve some of that. Well, I think that you, the, what you're laying out basically is fascinating, Bob, and we're gonna talk some more about that in our, in our, our upcoming show, because I do wanna talk about and look more uh, closely at uh, a number of local developments, politically and economically, and the, and the ties between both. But that's for another show. Uh, folks, I want to thank all of you for joining us once again for another voice of some voices from the margin uh, this evening. Uh, thank you for joining us. We'll be back again next week at the same time, uh, eight o'clock on Thursday. Um, and we'll announce in the next few days who will be joining us for that show next week. So thanks again. Thank you for all of your questions. Uh, uh, please, uh, you can go and, and you can follow me at uh, ajamabaraka.com. Uh, also, uh, the new formation that we have developed, uh, the Black Alliance for Peace. You can get more information on that uh, at black www.blackallianceforpeace.com. Uh, we got a lot of work to do, and we're going to be talking about uh, that work this weekend uh, here in North Carolina at the uh, North Carolina State Convention. So thanks a lot, everybody. See you next week.